Understanding Physics, Three Volumes in One, by Isaac Asimov. Read, recorded, and edited by John Loth. Chapter 9. Liquids. Pressure. So far, I have assumed that the bodies which have been under discussion are solid, that is, that they are more or less rigid and have a definite shape. They resist any force tending to alter or deform that shape, although if the force increases without limit, a point is eventually reached where even the most rigid solid shape will deform or break. Solids behave all in a piece, so if a part of a solid moves, all of it moves, and in such a way as to maintain the shape. There are bodies, however, which do not have a definite shape and do not resist deformation. If a stretch or shear, even a small one, is exerted upon them, they alter their shape in response. In particular, they will respond to the force of gravity and alter their shape in such a way as to reduce their potential energy to a minimum. In response to gravity, such bodies will move downward and flatten out as much as possible. In so doing, they will take on the shape of any container in which they might be. If the container is open at the top and is tipped, or if any opening is made at the bottom, the material will pour out under the influence of gravity. To take up a new position of still lower potential energy on the table top, the floor, or in a hole. It is this ability to pour or flow that gives such bodies the name of fluids, from a Latin word meaning to flow. Fluids fall into two classes. In one class, the downward force of gravity is paramount, so the fluid, while taking on the shape of the container, collects in the lowermost portion and does not necessarily fill it. Such fluids have a definite volume, if not a definite shape, and are called liquids, also from a Latin word meaning to flow. Water is, of course, the most familiar liquid. In the other class of fluids, the downward force of gravity is countered by other effects to be discussed in later chapters. In this class, there is a certain concentration toward the bottom of a container, but not enough to notice under ordinary conditions. On the whole, such a fluid spreads itself more or less evenly through a confined space and has no definite volume of its own. Such fluids, without either a definite shape or a definite volume, are gases. Air is the most familiar gas. I will take up each variety of fluid separately and will begin with liquids. The weight of an object, as I explained earlier, is a downward force exerted by that object in response to the gravitational pull. In the case of solids, this force makes itself evident through whatever portion of its nether surface makes contact with another body. Since the nether surface is usually rough, even if only on a microscopic scale, the force is uneven, being exerted at those points where contact is actually made and not at others where contact is not made. For this reason, it is usually convenient to speak only of the total downward force exerted by a solid body, and this is indeed done when we speak of its weight. In the case of a liquid, however, the contact between its nether surface and the object it rests upon is quite smooth and evenly distributed, so that all portions receive their equal share. For fluids, therefore, it becomes convenient to speak of weight or more properly, force per unit area. This force per unit area is termed pressure. It is common to use as a unit of pressure pounds per square inch, sometimes abbreviated PSI, where pounds are a unit of weight in this connection and not unit of mass. Footnote. The word gas was coined about 1600 by a Flemish chemist. Jean Baptista von Helmond, 1577 to 1644, who supposedly derived it from the Greek word chaos. Second footnote, if we get sufficiently submicroscopic, unevenness does show up, to be sure, 
This is because matter is not really continuous, but is composed of discrete particles called atoms. We don't have to worry about this right now, but we'll consider it later. See page 143. In the metric system, the proper units of pressure are newtons per square meter in the MKS system and dynes per square centimeter in the CGS system. Since a newton equals 100,000 dynes and a square meter equals 10,000 square meters, one newton square meter is the equivalent of 100,000 dynes per 10,000 square centimeters or 10,000 dyne centimeters squared. Translating into metric units, one pound square inch is equal to 69,000 newton square meters, and one gram per square centimeter is equal to 98 newtons square meters. Suppose we consider a square centimeter of the bottom of a container filled with liquid to a height n. The pressure, dynes centimeters squared, depends on the weight of liquid resting on that square centimeter. The weight depends, in part at least, upon the volume of the column, one square centimeter in cross-sectional area, and n centimeters high. The volume of that column is n cubic centimeters. It does not follow, however, that in knowing the volume of a substance we also know its weight. It is common knowledge that the weight of a body of given volume varies according to the nature of the substance making up the body. We are all ready to admit, for instance, that iron is heavier than aluminum. By that, of course, is meant that a given volume of iron is heavier than the same volume of aluminum. If we remove this restriction to equal volumes, we will be faced by the fact that a larger ingot of aluminum is much heavier than an iron nail. For any object, the weight per unit volume is its density, and in the metric system the units of density are usually expressed as grams of weight per cubic centimeter, or kilograms of weight per cubic meter. We should therefore say that iron is denser rather than heavier than aluminum. If the height of a column of liquid resting upon a unit area determines its volume, and the density of that liquid gives the weight of a unit volume, then the total weight of the unit area, or pressure, P, is equal to the height of the liquid column, H, multiplied by its density, D, so that pressure is equal to height times density, or P equals H times D. Equation, 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 equation 9-1. Footnote. This assumes that the density does not vary along the height of the column, and as far as liquids are concerned, any variation of density with depth is small enough to be ignored for small pressures. This will not be so for gases. See page 145. The pressure of a liquid on the bottom of a container, therefore, depends only upon the height and density of the liquid, and not upon the shape of the container or the total quantity of liquid in the container. This means that the various containers shown in the accompanying figure, with bottoms of equal areas, but with different shapes and containing different quantities of liquid, will have their bottoms placed under equal pressure. It is easy to see that the container with the expanded upper portion ought to experience the same pressure at the bottom, for the height of the additional liquid is clearly supported by the upper horizontal portion of the container. It may seem not at all logical, however, that the container with the contracted upper portion should also experience the same pressure at the bottom. The missing liquid, not present because of the contraction, has no weight to contribute to the pressure. How then does the pressure remain as great as if the missing liquid were there? To explain that, we must realize that pressure is exerted differently in liquids as compared with solids. A solid resists the deforming influence of its own weight. A large pillar of marble may rest solidly on a stone floor and transmit a great deal of pressure to that floor, but it will itself remain unmoved under its own weight. The pillar will not, for instance, belly out in the middle, and if we place our hands on the side of the pillar, we will be aware of no pressure thrusting out sideways. Imagine, however, a similar pillar made of water. 
it could not remain in existence for more than a fraction of a second. Under the force of its own weight, it would belly outward at every point and collapse. If a pillar of water is encased in a restraining cylinder of aluminum, the outward bellying tendency of the water will evidence itself as a sidewise force. If a hole is punched in the aluminum cylinder, water will spurt out sidewise under the influence of that force. This same line of reasoning would show that a liquid would exert a pressure against a diagonally slanted wall with which it made contact. A fluid, indeed, exerts pressure in all directions, and particularly in a direction perpendicular to any wall with which it may make contact. The amount of pressure exerted at any given point depends upon the height of liquid above that particular point. Thus, if a hole is punched in a cylindrical container of water, the liquid will spurt out with more force if the hole is near the bottom, with a great height of liquid above, than if it is near the top, with but a small height of liquid above. There is a pressure of the fluid up against the horizontal section, as indicated in the diagram. The amount of this pressure depends upon the height of the liquid above that horizontal section. By Newton's third law, the upper horizontal section exerts an equal pressure down upon the liquid. The downward pressure of the horizontal section is equal to that which would be produced by the missing liquid if it were there and so the pressure at the bottom of the container remains the same. Buoyancy The generalization concerning pressure, made use of in the previous section, was first clearly stated by the French mathematician Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662, and is therefore often referred to as Pascal's principle. This can be expressed as follows. Pressure exerted anywhere on a confined liquid is transmitted unchanged to every portion of the interior and to all the walls of the containing vessel, and is always exerted at right angles to the walls. This principle can be used to explain the observed fact that if a container of liquid contains two or more openings, to which are connected tubes of various shapes into which the liquid can rise, and if enough liquid is presented in the container, so that the level will rise into those tubes, the liquid will rise to the same height in each. To explain this, let us consider the case of a container with two openings, and let us imagine a porous vertical partition dividing the container between the two openings. The pressure against the partition from the left would depend on the height of the liquid on the left, while the pressure from the right would depend on the height of the liquid on the right. If the liquid column is higher on the left, the pressure from the left is greater than that from the right, and there is a net pressure from left to right. Liquid is forced through the partition in that direction, so that the height of the liquid on the left decreases and that on the right increases. When both heights are equal, there is no net pressure either left or right, and therefore no further motion. This effect is part of folk knowledge as is witnessed by the common saying that water seeks its own level. Notice that I'm taking for granted here that liquids will move or flow in response to a force, and this is actually so. The laws of motion apply to fluids as well as to solids, and the study of mechanics includes, in its broad sense, forces and motions involving fluids as well as solids. However, it is quite common to restrict the use of the term mechanics to solid bodies. The mechanics of liquids is then given the special name hydrodynamics, from Greek words meaning the motions of water, and the mechanics of gases is called pneumatics, from the Greek word for air. These may be grouped together as fluid mechanics. It is not only the weight of the liquid itself that can be transmitted to every part of the liquid as a pressure. Any applied force can be so transmitted. For instance, suppose a liquid completely fills a container with two necks, each neck being stoppered by a movable piston, which we can assume to be weightless. Suppose, furthermore, that the necks are of different width, so the piston in the larger neck has a cross-sectional area of 10 centimeters squared, while that in the smaller one has a cross-sectional area 
of only one centimeter squared. Now imagine that a force of one dyne is exerted downward on the smaller piston. Since the area of the smaller piston is one centimeter squared, the pressure upon it as a result of the applied force is one dyne centimeter squared. In accordance with Pascal's principle, this pressure is transmitted unchanged through the entire body of liquid and perpendicularly to all the walls. It is transmitted, in particular, perpendicularly to that portion of the wall represented by the larger piston. As the small piston moves downward, then, the larger piston moves upward. The upward pressure against the large piston must be the same as the downward pressure against the smaller piston, one dine centimeter squared. The area of the larger piston is, however, ten centimeters squared. The total force against the larger piston is therefore one dine centimeter squared, multiplied by ten centimeters squared, or ten dines. The total force has been multiplied tenfold, and the weight which the original force would have been capable of lifting has been multiplied tenfold. It is by hydraulic presses, based on this effect, that heavy weight can be lifted with an expenditure of but a reasonable amount of force. Are we in this way getting something for nothing? Not at all. Suppose we press down on a small piston, one centimeter squared in area, and make it move a distance one centimeter. The volume of liquid it has displaced is one centimeter squared multiplied by one centimeter, and this comes to one cubic centimeter. The larger piston, ten centimeters squared in area, can only move upward a sufficient distance to make room for the displaced one cubic centimeter of liquid. The distance required is one cubic centimeter, divided by ten centimeters squared, or zero point one centimeter. Thus the situation is the same as it was for the lever. See page 89. The force has been multiplied tenfold, yes, but the distance through which the force has been exerted has been reduced to one-tenth. The total work, force times distance, obtained from the hydraulic press is the same, if we neglect such things as friction as the total work put into it. The pressure of a liquid will be transmitted not only to the walls of a container, but also perpendicularly to the surfaces of any solid object within the liquid. Imagine a cube of iron suspended in liquid so that the top and bottom surface of the cube are perfectly horizontal and the other four surfaces are perfectly vertical. The pressure against each of the four vertical surfaces depends on the height of liquid above them, which is the same for all. For the vertical surfaces, then, we have equal pressures arranged in opposing pairs. There is, consequently, no net sideways pressure in any direction. But what if we consider the two horizontal surfaces, the one on top and the one on bottom? It is clear that there is a greater height of liquid above the lower surface than above the upper one. There is therefore a comparatively great upward pressure against the lower surface and a comparatively small downward pressure against the upper surface. As a result, a net upward force is exerted by the liquid upon the submerged object. This is most easily reasoned out in the case of the solid cube, but it can be shown to hold for a solid of any shape, or for that matter, for a submerged drop of liquid or bubble of gas. This upward force of liquids against submerged objects is called buoyancy. How large is this buoyant force? Consider a solid body dropping into the liquid contents of a vessel. The solid must make room for its own volume by pushing aside or displacing an equivalent volume of liquid, and the liquid level in the vessel rises sufficiently to accommodate that displaced volume. It therefore follows that the submerging solid is exerting a downward force on the liquid, a force large enough to balance the weight of the solid's own volume of liquid. By Newton's third law, it is to be expected that the liquid will in turn exert an upward force on the solid equivalent to the weight of that same quantity of liquid. The original weight of the submerged body is equal to its own volume, V, times its density, D. 
the weight of the displaced liquid is equal to its volume, which is the same as the volume of the submerged solid, and hence also V, times its density. The weight of the body, after submersion, W, is equal to its original weight minus the weight of the displaced water, or W equals V times D minus V times D. Equation 9-2 Solving for D, the density of the submerged solid, we have D equals W plus V times D divided by V. Equation 9-3 The weight of the immersed body, W, can be directly measured. The volume of the displaced fluid, V, is obtained at once from the rise in the water level and the cross-sectional area of the container and the density of the fluid, D, is also easily measured. With this data in hand, the density of the immersed body can be calculated easily from equation 9-3. This method of measuring density was first made use of by the Greek mathematician Archimedes in the 3rd century BC. The story is that King Hero of Syracuse, having received a gold crown from the goldsmith, suspected graft. The goldsmith had, the king felt, alloyed the gold with cheaper silver and had pocketed the difference. Archimedes was asked to tell whether this had been done without, of course, damaging the crown. Archimedes knew that a gold-silver alloy would have a smaller density than would gold alone, but he was at a loss for a method of determining the density of the crown. He needed both its weight and its volume for that. And while he could weigh it easily enough, he could not estimate the volume without pounding it into a cube or sphere or some other shape for which the volume could then be worked out by the geometry of the time. And pounding the crown would have been frowned on by Hero. The principle of buoyancy is supposed to have occurred to Archimedes when he lowered himself into a full bathtub and noted the displaced water running over the sides. He ran naked through the streets of Syracuse, so the story goes, shouting, Hoyreka, Hoyreka, I've got it, I've got it. By immersing the crown in water and measuring the new weight together with the rise in water level, and then doing the same for an equal weight of pure gold, he could tell at once that the density of the crown was considerably less than that of the gold. The goldsmith was suitably punished. The principle of buoyancy is sometimes called Archimedes' principle as a result. If an immersed body has a greater density than that of the fluid in which it is immersed, then uppercase D is greater than lowercase d, and V times uppercase D is naturally greater than V times lowercase d. From equation 9-2, we see that, in that case, the weight W of the immersed body must be a positive number. The weight of the body is decreased, but it is still larger than zero, and falls through the fluid. Thus, a solid iron or aluminum object will fall through water. However, if the immersed body has a smaller density than that of the fluid, then uppercase D is smaller than lowercase d. V times uppercase D is smaller than V times lowercase d, and the immersed body has a weight that is a negative number. With a negative weight, so to speak, it moves upward rather than downward in response to a gravitational field. Thus a piece of wood or a bubble of air submerged in water will fall upward if left free to move. A solid body, less dense than the fluid that surrounds it, will float partially submerged on the surface of the fluid under conditions where the weight of water it displaces is equal to its own original weight. In such a case, its weight in water is zero, and it neither rises nor falls. The solid body floats when it has displaced just enough water, less than its own volume, to equal its own original weight. It is not to be supposed, though, that because a steel ship floats, the density of steel is less than that of water. It is not the steel of the ship alone that displaces water. The ship is hollow, and as it sinks into the water, the enclosed air displaces water just as the steel does. 
The density of the steel plus enclosed air is less than the density of water, though the density of steel alone most certainly is not, and so the steel ship floats. The force of buoyancy, by the way, is not a matter of calculations and theory alone. It can easily be felt. Lift a sizable rock out of the water, and its sudden gain in weight as it emerges into the air can be staggering. Float a sizable block of wood on a water surface, and try to push it down so that it will be completely submerged, and you will feel the counterforce of buoyancy most definitely. Cohesion and Adhesion Solids, as I said at the beginning of the chapter, act all in a piece. Each fragment of a solid object clings firmly to every other fragment, so if you seize one corner of a rock and lift, the entire substance of the rock rises. This sticking together is called cohesion, from Latin words meaning to stick to. Fluids have nothing like the kind of cohesion that exists in solids. If you dip your hand into water and try to lift a piece of it, in the hopes that the entire quantity will rise out of its container, you will only get your fingers wet. Nevertheless, one should not conclude from this that the force of cohesion in liquids is completely absent. The force is much smaller in most liquids than in solids, but it is not entirely zero. This is most clearly seen at the surface of a liquid. In the body of a liquid, even a short way below the actual surface, a given portion of the liquid is attracted by cohesive forces in all directions equally by the other portions of the liquid that surround it. There is no net unbalanced force in any particular direction. Footnote. In solids, the various particles constituting the substance are lined up in fixed and orderly positions, rather than moving about freely as in liquids. For that reason, the cohesive forces between neighboring particles in solids are oriented in definite directions and are very noticeable. At the surface of the liquid, however, the cohesive forces are directed only inward, toward the body of the liquid, and not outward, where there is no liquid to supply cohesive forces. Most often, there is only air on the other side of the liquid surface, and the attractive forces between air and the liquid are so small that they can be ignored. The resultant of this semisphere of cohesive forces about a particle of liquid in the surface is a net inward force exerted perpendicularly from that surface. To keep liquid in the surface against this inward force requires work, so the surface represents a form of energy of position or potential energy. This particular form is usually called surface energy. Such surface energy is distributed over an area of surface, so its units are those of work per area. In the MKS system, this would be joules per square meter, and in the CGS system, it would be ERGs per square centimeter. In the case of surface energy, the CGS system is the more convenient and is generally used. One ERG is equal to one dyne centimeter, or one lowercase g square centimeter square centimeter. So one ERG square centimeter is equal to one dyne centimeter per square centimeter. If we cancel one of the centimeter units, this becomes one dyne centimeter squared centimeter, or one dyne centimeter. And as a matter of fact, the units of surface energy are most often presented with the last named unit, dynes per centimeter. Left to itself, surface energy reduces to a minimum in a way analogous to that in which gravitational potential energy is reduced whenever a ball high in the air falls to the ground or in which a column of liquid flattens and spreads out if the container is broken. A small quantity of liquid suspended in air will take up the shape of a sphere, for a sphere has for its volume the smallest area of surface. Therefore, surface energy is then reduced to a minimum. Such a sphere of liquid is, however, distorted into a tear-shaped object by the unbalanced downward pull of gravity. If it is falling through air, as a raindrop does, for instance, it will be flattened at the bottom through the upward force of air resistance. 
The smaller the droplet of liquid, the smaller the relative effects of gravity and air resistance, and the more nearly spherical it is. Soap bubbles are hollow. Liquid structures that are so light for their volume, because of enclosed air, that the forces of gravity, usually low in this case, and of air resistance, usually high, cancel each other out. Soap bubbles therefore drift about slowly and show themselves to be virtually perfect spheres. A sizable quantity of liquid flattens out. The necessity of minimizing the gravitational potential energy rises superior to that of minimizing the surface potential energy, and the surface of an undisturbed pail of water or pond of water seems to be a plane. Actually, it is a segment of a sphere. But a large one, one that has a radius equal to that of the Earth. Look at the Pacific Ocean on a globe of the Earth, and you will see that its surface almost forms a semisphere. If energy in any form is added to a liquid, some may well go into increasing the surface energy by extending the surface area beyond its minimum. Thus wind will cause the surface of an ocean or lake to become irregular and therefore increase in surface area. The surface in a glass of water will froth if the glass is shaken. Because the surface is stretched into a larger area by such an input of energy, and because it pulls back to the minimum when the energy input ceases, the analogy between the liquid surface and an elastic skin under tension, a very thin film of stretched rubber, for instance, is unmistakable. The surface effects are therefore frequently spoken of as being caused by surface tension rather than by surface energy. The same sort of cohesive forces that act to hold different portions of a liquid together via surface tension also act to hold a portion of a liquid in contact with a portion of a neighboring solid. In the latter case, where the attractive force is between solid and liquid, unlike particles, rather than between liquid and itself, like particles, the phenomena is called adhesion, also like cohesion from Latin words meaning to stick to. Adhesive forces may be as great as or even greater than cohesive forces. In particular, the adhesion of water to clean glass is greater than the cohesion of water to itself. This has an effect on the shape of the liquid surface of water in a glass container. Where the water meets the glass, the attraction of the glass for water is large enough to overcome water's cohesive forces. As a result, the water surface rises upward so as to increase the water-glass contact or interface as much as possible at the expense of the weaker water-to-water -water forces. If there were no countering forces, water would rise to the top of the container and over. However, there is the countering force of gravity. There comes a point where the weight of the raised water, added to the cohesive forces of water, just balances the upward pull of the adhesive forces, and a point of equilibrium is reached after the water level has been raised by a moderate degree. If the container is reasonably wide, this upward bending of the surface is restricted only to the neighborhood of the water-glass contact. The water surface in the interior remains flat, where the container is a relatively narrow one, however, the surface of the liquid is all in the region of water-glass contact, and the liquid surface is then nowhere plain. Instead it forms a semisphere, bending down to a low point in the center of the tube. Viewed from the side, the surface resembles a crescent moon, and indeed it is spoken of as a meniscus, Greek for little moon. Cohesive forces may well be larger than adhesive forces in particular cases. For instance, the cohesive forces in liquid mercury are much larger than those in water. They are also larger than the adhesive forces between mercury and glass. If we look at mercury in a glass tube, we see that at the interface where mercury meets glass, the mercury pulls away from the glass, reducing the mercury-glass interface. The mercury meniscus in such a tube bends downward at the edges and rises to a maximum height at the center of the tube. The same is true even for water if the glass container has a coating of wax, 
since the adhesive forces between water and wax are less than the cohesive forces within water. If water is spilled onto a flat surface of glass, it will spread out into a thin film so as to make the greatest possible contact, adding to the total adhesive force at the expense of the weaker cohesive force. The water, in other words, wets the glass. Mercury, however, when spilled on glass, or water on a waxed surface, makes as little contact with the glass as possible, drawing itself into a series of small, gravity-distorted spheres, and adding to the total cohesive force at the expense of the weaker adhesive force. Mercury does not wet glass, and water does not wet wax. In all these events, the effect is to reduce the total surface energy, that of the liquid to air interface, plus that of the liquid to solid interface, to a minimum. Where a water-containing tube attached to a water reservoir is narrow, the rise in water level brought about by the upward force of adhesion is considerable, and the water rises markedly above its natural level. See page 120. It is possible to calculate what the raised height, lowercase h, of the water level must be in a particular tube. Adhesion is a form of surface tension, which we can represent as the Greek letter sigma. Acting around the rim of the circle, where water meets the glass of the tube, the circle has a length of 2 times pi times r, where r is the radius of the tube. The total upward force brought about by adhesion is therefore the surface tension of the water-glass interface, sigma dine centimeters, multiplied by the length of the circle where water and glass meet, 2 times pi times the radius centimeter, so that the total force is 2 times pi times the radius times sigma dines. Countering this upward force is the downward force of gravitation, which is equal to the weight, m times g, dines, see page 54, of the raised water. The mass of the column of water raised by adhesion is equal to its volume, lowercase v, times its density, lowercase d. Substituting v times d for m, we see that the weight of the water is v times d times g dines. Since the raised column of water in the tube is in the form of a cylinder, we can make use of the geometric formula for the volume of a cylinder and say that the volume of the raised water is equal to the height of the column, h, multiplied by the cross-sectional area, pi times r squared, where r is the radius of the column. Substituting pi times r squared times h for v, we see that the weight of the water is pi times r squared times h times d times g dines. When the water in the narrow tube has been raised as high as it will go, the upward adhesive force is balanced by the downward gravitational force. So we have 2 times pi times r times sigma equals pi times r squared times h times d times g. Equation 9-4. Solving for h, h equals 2 times sigma divided by r times d times g. Equation 9-5. The acceleration due to gravity, g, is fixed for any given point on the Earth, and for any particular liquid, the surface tension, sigma, and the density, d, are fixed for the particular conditions of the experiment. The important variable is the radius of the tube, r. As you see, the height to which a column of water is drawn upward, in a narrow tube, is inversely proportional to the radius of the tube. The narrower the tube, the greater the height to which the liquid is lifted. Consequently, the effect is most noticeable in tubes, natural or artificial, of microscopic width. These are capillary tubes, from a Latin expression meaning hair-like, and the rise of columns of water in such tubes is called capillary action. It is through capillary action that water rises through the narrow interstices of a lump of sugar or a piece of blotting paper, and it is at least partially through capillary action that water rises upward through the narrow tubes within the stems of plants, 
Again, if we know the value of the density of a liquid and the extent of its rise in a tube of known radius, both rise and radius being easily measured, it follows that since the value of G is also known, the value of the surface tension, sigma, can be calculated from equation 9-5. In the case of mercury, where the adhesive forces with glass are exerted downwards, the level is pulled below the natural level. The degree to which the level is lowered is increased as the radius of the tube is decreased. Viscosity We are accustomed to the notion of friction as a force that is exerted opposite to that which brings about motion when one solid moves in contact with another. Such friction tends to slow and eventually stop motion unless the propulsive force is vigorously maintained. There is also friction where a solid moves through a fluid, as when a ship plows through water. For all that water seems so smooth and lacking its projections to catch at the ship, the ship, once set in motion, will speedily come to a halt. Its energy absorbed in overcoming the friction with the water, unless the propulsive force is vigorously maintained there too. This friction arises from the fact that it is necessary to expend energy to pull the water apart against its own cohesive forces in order to make room for the ship or other object to pass through. The energy expended varies with the shape of the object moving through the fluid. If the fluid is pulled apart in such a way as to force it into eddies and other unevenness of motion, turbulence, the energy expended is multiplied and the motion stops the sooner. To prevent a stop, the propulsive force must be increased. If instead the fluid is pulled apart gradually by the forward edge of the moving object and allowed to come together even more gradually behind, so turbulence is held at a minimum, the energy expended is reduced considerably and the force required to maintain motion is likewise reduced. A streamlined shape, consisting of a bluntly curving fore and a narrowly tapering rear, as the teardrop shape of water drops falling through air, and of fish, penguins, seals, and whales moving through water. It is used in human devices, too, where motion through a liquid medium with maximum economy is desired. Such use was enforced by hit-and-miss practice long before it was explained by theory. The friction between a moving solid and a surrounding liquid increases with velocity. Thus an object falling through water is accelerated by the gravitational pull against the resistance of friction with the water. However, as the velocity of the falling body increases, the resisting friction increases too. The force of gravity, of course, remains constant. Eventually, the resisting force of friction increases to the point where it balances the force of gravity. So acceleration is then reduced to zero. Once that happens, the body falls through the liquid at a constant terminal velocity. We ourselves are easily made aware of the friction of solids moving through liquids. Anyone trying to walk waist deep in water cannot help but be conscious of the unusual consumption of energy required and of the slow motion effect. The friction makes itself evident even when the liquid itself is the only substance involved. When a liquid moves, it does not move all in one piece as a solid does. Instead, a given portion will move relative to a neighboring portion, and an internal friction between these two portions will counter the motion. Where the cohesive forces that impose this internal friction are low, as in water, we are not ordinarily very conscious of this. Where they are high, as in glycerol or in concentrated sugar solutions, the fluid pours slowly, so slowly indeed that, accustomed as we are to the comparatively rapid water flow, we tend to grow impatient with it. The internal friction is higher at lower temperatures than at high temperatures. 
the folk saying, as slow as molasses in January, points up our impatience. A slowly pouring liquid is said to be viscous, from the Latin word for a sticky species of bird lime that had this property. The internal friction that determines the manner in which a liquid will pour is called the viscosity. There are liquids that are so viscous that the pull of gravity is not sufficient to make them flow against the strong internal friction. Glass is such a liquid, and its viscosity is such that it seems a solid to the ordinary way of thinking. Footnote. That glass is not a solid, despite its seeming so, is evidenced by its lack of certain properties characteristic of solids. Glass does not have a crystalline structure, for instance, or a sharp melting point. Even so, the case of glass is evidenced enough that the distinction between a solid and a liquid is not as clear-cut as might be expected from the most common examples of either. Indeed, most differences and distinctions in science are artificial human conventions imposed on a very complicated universe, and such distinctions cannot help but become fuzzy if viewed with sufficient attention to detail. To consider the measurement of viscosity, imagine two parallel layers of liquid, each in the form of a square of a given area, A, and separated by a distance, D. To make one of these squares move with respect to the other at velocity, V, against the resisting internal friction, requires a force, F. It turns out that the relationship among these properties can be expressed by the following equation. F times D divided by V times A equals eta, or the Greek letter for eta, where eta is a constant at a given temperature and represents the measure of viscosity. Equation 9-6. The unit of viscosity can be determined from equation 9-6. The expression F times D in the numerator of the fraction in equation 9-6 represents force multiplied by distance or work. The unit of work in the CGS system is dyne centimeter or GMCM squared second squared. The expression VA in the denominator of the fraction represents volume, centimeters per second, multiplied by area, square centimeters. The unit of V times A, therefore, is centimeters second, squared centimeters, or centimeters squared second. To get the unit of viscosity in the CGS system, we must therefore divide the unit of F times D by that of V times A. It turns out that gm centimeter squared second squared divided by cubic square centimeter second works out by ordinary algebraic manipulation to gm centimeter second or grams per centimeter second or gm centimeter second is defined as one poise in honor of the French physician Jean-Louis Marie Poiseuille 1799 to 1869 who in 1843 was the first to study viscosity in a quantitative manner. As a physician, he was primarily interested in the manner in which that viscous fluid, blood, moved through the narrow blood vessels. The poise is too large for convenience in dealing with most liquids, so the centipoise, one hundredth of a poise, and even the millipoise, one thousandth of a poise, are commonly used. Thus the viscosity of water at room temperature is just about one centipoise. At the same temperature, the viscosity of diethyl ether, the common anesthetic, is 0 0.23 centipoises, or 2.3 millipoises, while the viscosity of glycerol is about 15,000 centipoises, or 15 poises. The motion of a fluid has an effect upon its pressure. Imagine a column of water flowing through a horizontal tube of fixed diameter. The water is under pressure, or it would not be moving, and the pressure, force per unit area, is the same at all points, for the water is flowing at the same velocity at all points. This could be demonstrated if the pipe were pierced at intervals and a tube inserted into each orifice. 
the water would rise to the same level in each tube. But suppose the pipe had a constricted area in the middle. The same volume of water would have to pass through the constricted area in a given time as would have to pass through an equal length of unconstricted area. If that were not the case, water would pile up at the entrance to the constriction, which of course it does not. If the constriction were narrow enough to prevent flow altogether, flow would stop and the volume of water passing through a given section would be zero cubic centimeter seconds, in the constricted and unconstricted areas alike. But in order for the same volume of water to pass through the constricted and unconstricted areas in a given time, the flow of water must be more rapid through a constricted area. Just as the wide, slowly flowing river becomes a tumbling torrent when passing through a narrow gorge. Since the velocity of water increases as it enters the constricted area, it is subject to an acceleration, and this must be brought about by a force. We can most easily find such a force by supposing a difference in pressure. If the pressure in the unconstricted portion is greater than that in the constricted portion, then there is a net force from the unconstricted portion, high pressure, toward the constricted portion, low pressure, and the liquid is indeed accelerated as it enters the constriction. Furthermore, when the liquid leaves the constriction and enters a new unconstricted area, its velocity must decrease again. This involves an acceleration again, and there must be a force in the direction opposite to the flow in order to bring about such a slowing of velocity. However, if the new unconstricted area is a region of high pressure again, such a force can be accounted for. In short, it can be concluded as an important generalization that the pressure of a liquid, or a fluid generally, falls as its velocity increases. This is called Bernoulli's principle, after the Swiss mathematician Daniel Bernoulli, 1700-1782, who was the first to study the phenomena in 1738, and who, on that occasion, invented the term hydrodynamics.